Hello everyone, Russ Barkley here again, and this is part two of my commentary on the link of ADHD with substance use disorders. In this part, I want to speak to you about the implications of this comorbidity of these two disorders for diagnosis and management. As you know, in the first lecture, I talked more about why ADHD is predisposing to such risks and what exactly those risks might be. By the way, sorry for the uh, microphone trouble in that last video. Uh, the microphone didn't seem to be working, but it did pick up the room tone microphone as well. So I hope that that was adequate for you. Uh, thanks. So uh, let's get started with this PowerPoint presentation and see what's going on here. Now, the impact of a substance use disorder on diagnosing ADHD has been pretty controversial out there in clinical practice. We know that various substances can have adverse effects on anyone's attention, distractibility, activity level, and impulse control. So that just the abuse of certain substances like cocaine, amphetamine, methamphetamine, can produce symptoms that mimic ADHD-like symptoms as a result of excessive use of those substances. So that has led some clinicians to be very reticent about diagnosing ADHD in the presence of a substance use disorder. After all, there's a real chicken and egg problem going on here. Which came first? How do I know? Uh, am I at risk of worsening the substance use problem if I treat the ADHD with a stimulant. We'll talk about that in a moment. So, so sorting out the causal direction uh, is a bit difficult, but it's not impossible. First of all, ADHD starts far earlier in the life course of an individual than do the substance use problems, which often are not seen until adolescence or at the very latest, late childhood. Typically, ADHD has an onset much earlier than that during the elementary school years. Uh, and therefore, just by taking a careful history, a clinician should be able to tease apart which one of these was the first disorder and which one occurred second and possibly secondarily to that ADHD. Now, some clinicians won't consider a diagnosis of ADHD until the person with the substance use problem has been detoxed from that substance. I get it. They want to be sure that the symptoms of ADHD are still there when the substance use is not problematic. But on the other hand, that can come back to, to bite you. That's, that's not advisable, in my opinion, because first of all, ADHD is a self-regulation disorder. So it's going to make detoxing from the substance more problematic for the individual. In fact, they might not be able to detox at all. So now what? Are you not going to treat their substance use or treat their ADHD because you're just not sure? Also, untreated patients with ADHD will be more likely to fail in a detox program, as we know from recent research, uh, and thus go without the diagnosis of ADHD and just be viewed as a sort of detox treatment failure. That's not fair to them either because the failure to recognize their ADHD has led us to not taking that into account in trying to help them detox from the drugs that they're using. Uh, also, the failure to diagnose and treat the ADHD can lead to a more prolonged pattern and a more excessive pattern of substance use problems, as well as a poor response to rehabilitation. And finally, where history supports the earlier onset of the ADHD diagnosis in the presence of a substance use problem, then one should treat the ADHD first or in the midst of treating the substance use problem and not wait until the substance use has resolved before deciding whether ADHD was there or not. So in other words, it really is more advisable when ADHD appears to be part of the combination of disorders a clinician is seeing to go ahead and make the diagnosis and treat the ADHD in order to help the individual with recovery from their substance use. I get it, there's great reluctance on the part of substance use specialists to treat ADHD 
with a stimulant medication for fear they'll exacerbate the substance use problem. Yet treating ADHD actually increases the likelihood of someone staying in detox or rehab by 40% or more and also being more successful in that rehab program, at least to some extent. By not treating ADHD, substance use specialists have increased the likelihood of attrition, of quitting the substance treatment program by as much as five times over what it would have been had they treated the ADHD first. So again, it's not advisable to wait for the individual to stop using a substance or to recover from substance use before we give any credence to the possibility that ADHD is a comorbid and likely first occurring disorder in these patients and is in need of treatment in its own right. Obviously, if we're going to treat these people with stimulants to help with their detox, then we need to watch for potential diversion or sale of the stimulant which is going to be something they might do in order to get the money to get the drug they wish to abuse. In that case, perhaps the use of a non-stimulant medication might be helpful or use of one of the less abusable stimulant medications uh, may also be a way around that. There may, of course, be a need to use additional medicines to help with drug withdrawal or detox particularly from nicotine or other substances. Uh, but that's not something that ADHD would have some impact on. Instead, you would do that whether somebody had ADHD or not. Combination medical management, combining cognitive behavior therapy for the adult executive function deficits could be useful along with medical management of the ADHD and helping the individual to recover from their substance use problems and would also be necessary in treating other possible comorbidities I mentioned, such as anxiety and depression, which can further exacerbate the risk for substance use problems. So in conclusion, we've seen in these videos that ADHD is a disorder of self-regulation, that those self-regulation problems predispose them to more impulsive daily life choices uh, in all of these interactions in which we have to choose between the consequences in the now and the consequences in the later, and it leads them to maximize momentary consequences over delayed consequences, making them more susceptible to addictions of all types, including substance use problems. This is why ADHD is often associated with impairments in most major life activities and why it's more likely to be associated with substance use problems such as experimentation, excess use, and even use to the point of qualifying for a diagnosis of a substance use disorder. Many of the risk factors that we saw in part one of this video can be reduced through various ADHD interventions, such as the use of medications, along with a combination of cognitive behavioral therapy and possibly adult ADHD coaching to help reduce the risk for substance use disorders or to help with recovery from a, sub a substance use disorder. So I think that ADHD, by implication then, is a very serious public health problem. And I talk about that in my lecture on the health outcomes associated with ADHD. There I pointed out that cases with ADHD in adulthood cost about $26,000 more per year in healthcare costs than we see in typical individuals without ADHD. And that has to do with their substance use problems, their accidental injuries, their risk taking, their car accidents, their predisposition to other antisocial activities and possibly other disabling conditions. Yet ADHD is a highly treatable disorder, incredibly responsive to the various treatments, including medications that are on the market today. Treating ADHD and especially its behavioral inhibition deficits and other executive function problems, especially with medication, can go a long way toward improving most of these impairments in major life activities, and in particular, improving their odds of a substance use problem and of recovering 
from a substance use problem. Also, this can help reduce many of the other associated health risks that we see in people with ADHD and thereby improve their life expectancy and their mortality rates. So I think that patients and families need to be made more aware of the risk that ADHD poses for substance use problems. Mental health professionals need to be more aware of the comorbidity here so that when they see individuals with substance use difficulties, they're more likely to evaluate them for adult ADHD uh, and vice versa. When you see ADHD individuals, keep in mind there could be an increased likelihood here of substance use problems. Primary care providers need to also be aware of this comorbidity in their practice. They're likely to be called upon to help treat a substance use problem, whether it's for nicotine, alcohol, caffeine, or other harder substances. Uh, but they are not as aware of ADHD. They've not been trained to recognize ADHD, and they might be overlooking one of the major factors that's contributing to the substance use problem of their patients. So assess teens and adults for ADHD whenever they present to primary care with substance use difficulties. And by treating their ADHD, you may make it more likely that you improve their chances of responding to the substance use interventions. Finally, I think government agencies that are tasked with dealing with these public health issues, particularly substance use problems, need to be more aware of this comorbidity and of the important role ADHD plays in risk for substance use and the importance of treating that ADHD first or along with the detox program in order to help people with their substance use problems. So thank you for joining me for this part two of my lecture on substance use disorders. Hope to see you again on this channel. If you like the content, again, please subscribe and, and also recommend us to your friends. Thanks again and be well.